Thank you, uh, Helen and John. I feel fully introduced. Uh, <laughs> and you've been offered uh, many reasons to dislike me, from Maris to my teaching years at St. Ignatius, to so I'm just going to roll out a few more of those as the evening goes on. Uh, uh, thank you for being here tonight on uh, this uh, frigid evening. Uh, one of my Jesuit brothers, with whom I share quarters upstairs, who has a rather snarky personality. I won't narrow it down any further, that keeps them all on the hunt. But uh, <laughs> we, uh, we, saw this, we saw this little flyer about an evening with Father McGrath, and I just laughed and laughed and laughed. Why would anybody want to do that? Uh, I agree, but uh, nonetheless, thank you for, for joining us tonight. Uh, to spend a little time reflecting on who we are and what we hope to be. I'd like to propose that my reflections tonight are simply and yet, I think, profoundly about this Jesuit thing. Uh, that's the clever title I've come up with for this evening. Uh, this Jesuit thing. I came to the Jesuits as Helen and, and Father Foley uh, Described, I came to the Jesuits somewhat late in my own life story. I was 33 years old when I joined the Jesuits. And my brother uh, informed me that, hey, that's the year and the age at which Jesus died. Um, <laughs> he's always been very supportive. <laughs> Everything I do. I informed him about being a uh, theologian that that was also the year Jesus rose from the dead. <laughs> He's more of a good Friday kind of guy. But uh, I came to the Jesuits kind of late, and actually, up until the point that I joined the Jesuits, my exposure to the Society of Jesus, to the Jesuits, was rather limited. I did go to graduate school at a Jesuit theology, a Jesuit theology school, but it wasn't until then, and also in graduate school, that I met my first Jesuit and encountered the Society of Jesus and what it does and how it looks at the world. And I have to admit that even after having gone through Jesuit theology school, I, I didn't know a whole lot about the Society of Jesus. And so I really came to the Jesuits in a backwards kind of way, teaching at a Jesuit high school, and having to teach the life of St. Ignatius Loyola. Uh, when I got hired, the teacher I was replacing had already ordered the books for the following year, and I was sort of stuck with those books. And one of the books was the autobiography of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Well, I love Ignatius of Loyola. I staked my life on his vision of the world, and it's really a pretty awful book. And uh, it's really hard to read, and I thought, oh my god, I teach 17-year-olds the 16th century piety. It's going to be a disaster, and it was. But uh, <laughs> I started to get a book about Ignatius, the person, Ignatius of Loyola, and sort of made my way into the story and the mission of the Jesuits through him, which is fairly typical of people's experience of religious communities. Francis, for the Franciscans, Dominic, Dominicans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I think so often we think we know what this thing is, this Jesuit way of doing things, this Jesuit way of doing education, this Jesuit mission in the world, this thing you've entrusted your daughters and sons to in the place we call Oil Academy, that you said by putting your children here and entrusting us to them, entrusting them to us, I want that, I want what you're doing there at Loyola for my kids, that distinctive Jesuit thing. And so I thought it might be helpful tonight if we just spent a little time tonight pondering what that thing is. A couple of stories about this Jesuit thing. There's an apocryphal story that has floated around the Jesuit secondary education for a very, very long time, and it goes this way. There's a professor at Harvard uh, who was a professor of English who was famous for saying, after handing out the penny back the first set of essays, I can always tell the students that went to a Jesuit high school. They know how to write, and they know how to think critically. Now, we told that story all the time in the teacher's lounge when I was teaching in English because we felt pretty good about ourselves. I don't know if it's true or not, but this is the apocryphal story. But I got some endorsement of that possible story being true one day when teaching at Ignatius and an envelope arrived from Georgetown, a Jesuit school. And the professor whom I had never met in my life was a professor of theology, a tenured professor of theology at Georgetown, 
and you've written me this cover letter and said, I can close in with her permission the paper of one of your former students. And he went on to talk about how this kid clearly not only knew how to write and think critically, but she had, with some help apparently, been able to really ponder what it was that she believed to be true about the world, what it was she believed to be true about her faith and her God. And it was this great maturity in her writing and her reflection. And she clearly had to have gone to a Jesuit school, he said. And then said that clearly her theology teacher was a profound influence in her life. <laughs> and she did that. But nonetheless, this Jesuit thing seems to manifest itself somewhere in the life of the mind and academics. And a quick survey of history, you begin to see that the Jesuits have been involved in academic life and teaching education for a long, long time. And there's some, even some notable Jesuits in fields of astronomy and geology and astrophysics and law and medicine. It's astounding, this Jesuit thing, as it plays itself out in education. And yet that's not the whole picture, this Jesuit thing. A second snapshot. Uh, a bunch of years ago, the Jesuits of the Chicago province said, uh, we want to be helpful to the growing uh, Spanish-speaking population in Chicago. And so, Cardinal Bernie invited us to take the parish in Pilsen, and so we took over a parish, in, a parish we continue to staff, St. Procopius, down at 16th or 18th in Allport. And the Jesuits went in there with the idea that we'd be the parish priests of that place for a while, but we were also going to listen to the neighborhood. We were going to let them tell us what they wanted from the Jesuits. And so we got very, very sophisticated in the ways our Jesuits would fanned out into the neighborhoods and eat dinner with people in their halls and listen to them talk about the neighborhood. We studied the demographics and the sociology of the neighborhood, and we're trying to come to some plan of what this would be, this mission in Tulsa. Finally, a coalition of grandmothers, Mexican-American grandmothers, made their way to the rectory one night and knocked on the door, and the pastor, Father Jim Gartman, who today serves as the president of Cristo Rey High School, opened the door, and his grandmother said, are you the guy in charge? And he said, yes. They, they said, you're the mother, you're the pastor here? He said, yes. And they said, um, you're a Jesuit, right? And he said, yes. <coughs> and you guys do schools, right? Well, yes, we have many schools. Would you please open a school? And they went on to say, why are you studying all the sociology and demographics? The grandmothers will tell you what you need to do. <laughs> oh, the school. It's what you do. They said, oh, thank you. That's, that's very enlightening. And we'll continue our studies. And three years later, we opened the school. We opened Cristo Rey Jesuit High School. And so the Mexican-American moms and grandmothers of Pilsen came to the Jesuits and said, our perception of this Jesuit thing is that you guys run high schools. And our kids and our grandkids need a high school. They need Catholic education, and we can't afford it anywhere else. Open a high school. This Jesuit thing. That's still not the whole story. It doesn't seem to capture for me this Jesuit thing. A third snippet, a friend of mine who I served on the board of the Jesuit High School with years ago was a wonderful woman, a very successful attorney. And I invited her to speak to a group of young Jesuits a few years ago about her experience of working with Jesuits on boards of trustees. We were trying to help the Jesuits learn how to be better collaborators uh, on boards of trustees. Uh, the implication being they weren't very good collaborators with people on boards of trustees. So I invited her to be on a panel and to speak to the Jesuits. And so I expected her to have some reflections about the mechanics of boards and how they work and what she had seen in Jesuits and what she liked and what she didn't like. And she started her comments and then she said, but wait, I'm going to tell you what I really need to tell you tonight. And she looked at these young Jesuits and she said, you guys saved my life. My friends were perplexed and had never met her before. And she went on to talk about how somehow the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, in her language, had saved her life. 
And what she wanted to tell us was that after a horrible divorce and a terribly dark period in her life, she stumbled upon Jesuits and the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. And she asked the Jesuit, can you direct me in the spiritual exercises, this template of prayer of St. Ignatius? And the Jesuit did, and something happened in her life and in her heart. And she said, everything changed, and I saw the world very differently. You guys saved my life. She said it a third time. She said, I hope you hear what I am saying. I am not being hyperbolic here. The Society of Jesus saved me. My life. Well, her experience was the spiritual exercises. Those little grandmothers in Pilsen, it was about a high school. For many of us, it's the experience of experience of Jesuit education. But I'd like to say tonight that the Jesuit thing is all of that and more. Now I sound like a huckster. Don't answer yet. How much would you pay for this? <laughs> Fuck out. Because the more is this. I think what the Jesuit thing is, is, is a shift in worldview. It's what my friend was getting closer to as she reflected with these young Jesuits about her experience of being saved by the spiritual exercises. And I'd like to suggest that the Jesuit thing, of course, is all about him. This is St. Ignatius of Loyola depicted in this icon here. Ignatius of Loyola is the fellow whose own personal experience became the archetype for the Society of Jesus, for the Jesuits. And I'd like to suggest that everything that the Jesuits do, and everything that we hope to be in our flawed humanity, everything that we try to do in our mission and in our work of schools and universities and retreat houses and parishes and social justice ministry and hospitals and all the rest of it, is that we're trying to change the way people see the world. You can use different words for this. You can talk about conversion, if you like. We're trying to convert hearts and minds. We're trying to help souls, was the language Ignatius liked most of all when he was asked to describe the mission of the Jesuits, to help souls. To me, it's about that happening and seeing the world differently as a result. Let me ask you to just think about this for a moment. How do you look at the world? How would you characterize your perspective or your way of looking at life every day? Maybe better or a way to get the answer a little bit more easily is how would your spouse describe the way you see the world? Or your kids? Or a best friend? Are you described as optimistic or pessimistic? Are you a realist? Are you somebody who doesn't notice the details but you're a big picture dreamer kind of guy? What do you see when you look at the world? What is it that colors your experience of life? And what are the filters through which you take your experience of life that inform what it is you've come to believe about the world and the way it works? The Jesuit thing is about what Ignatius came to see and what he wanted to share with the world as a way of seeing and as a way of doing life that's different firmly rooted in the Catholic faith, firmly rooted in the life of the Catholic Church and the theological narrative arc of salvation history as we've come to know it in Jesus, but a different way of seeing the world. At the end of the 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel is this wonderful story that goes something like this. As Jesus was making his way to Jericho with a sizable crowd, a man sat at the side of the road begging, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. As he heard the crowd pass by and knew that it was Jesus, he yelled out, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. And the crowd turned to rebuke him and told him to be quiet, but that made him yell all the louder, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. And Jesus said to the crowd, call him over. The crowd moved to him and said, get up, he's calling you. And Bartimaeus stood up, threw off his cloak, and ran to Jesus at the center of the group. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? I want to see, he said. Your faith has healed you. Go your way. And immediately he regained his sight and he followed Jesus on the way. 
Now, if you're like me, you must have thought those were good days for eye doctors and skin doctors with all the blindness and leprosy going on in the New Testament. But here's another blind person that encounters Jesus. And the story is important because Mark puts Bartimaeus in a particular place. He puts him on the road, but at the side of it. That is, he's on the pilgrimage of life, this metaphor of the road, of a life rolling out in front. But he's been pushed to the edge or to the side because he's been deemed inadequate or broken or sinful because of the burden he carries in his blindness. And in desperation, he yells out, help me, God, help me, Jesus, son of David. And Jesus uses the church, the community, to call him and to bring him to the center. And this is where it gets a little confusing to me, and I don't mean this to be a conversation about the consciousness of Jesus and the evolving theological dimensions of that. It's not the question, what did Jesus know and when did Jesus know it? That's for the Nixon administration. <laughs> the question here is, why does Jesus ask this question? He's a really smart guy, this Jesus. Bartimaeus is blind. Jesus has got a reputation for being a healer. What do you want me to do for you? I want to see. And so his faith heals them. And Jesus says, now go on your way. And Mark ends the passage by saying, and he followed Jesus on the way. He followed Jesus. His sight now is to see Jesus. So the question is, how is it that Bartimaeus now sees the world because he has met Jesus Christ? Ah. This is the Jesuit thing. Now we're getting closer. How do you see the world because you have come to know something about this Jesus? The one thing Ignatius ever fought with the Pope about publicly was the name of the Jesuits. Because he went and said, I want to call this the Compagnia de Jesus. I want this to be the society in translation. It comes to us as the Company of Jesus. Not as an incorporated corporation, but the company, the band, coming together. The Society of Jesus is the term that comes to us from the Latin gets thrown into all of this. And the Pope said, you want to be called the Companions of Jesus? And Ignatius says, yes, Holy Father, we would like to be called the Companions of Jesus. And the response to the Pope was something like this. And that's a little arrogant, don't you think? <laughs> Foreshadowing. <laughs> Don't you think every Christian is a companion of Jesus? Don't you think that's what it means to be a Catholic, to be a Christian, is to be a companion of Jesus? And Ignatius said, well, yes, of course, that's true. But I have come to experience something so profoundly personal and intimate and close in the friendship of Jesus that that's what I want to share with the world. And everything has changed as a result of that. And so we are then the companions of Jesus, that's our name. It becomes the society of Jesus, and it gets short and further to the Jesuits. But Ignatius, I don't think, would have liked that term, the Jesuits. I think he would have liked us to always say, we are the, the company of Jesus, the friends of the keeps. And it's changed everything by how I see the world. Think keep Bartimaeus in your mind as we, as we ponder this tonight. What does Bartimaeus do now that he has seen and light has come into his eyes for the first time, and color is something he can perceive now. To whom does he run immediately to tell this story to? He would be impelled, it seems to me, to go tell somebody about this. Who would you go to first? Who would you play jokes on? Who would you go to and say, can you believe what's happened to me? I can now see. Maybe he went first to his parents, or to his siblings but to people that have been cruel to him. Where did he go, and what's the story he had to tell? And I'm mean, guessing he was not very concerned about revenge at all. He was much more interested in just telling this story he can't quite conceive of exactly what happened here. But it's great, and it's extraordinary, and it's changed me. And Ignatius says, yes, it is great. It is extraordinary, and it is changing the way you see the world. Ignatius, the story, as you probably know, was that he was, he was a courtier, he was a man of the court, he was a warrior, he was uh, involved in the, the, the life of the court of Ferdinand and Isabella, he was kind of a low-level guy. He uh, was building a life for himself, though, in that little world of pageantry, 
when he was injured in battle with Pamplona, and he's carried home to his hometown of Loyola. That's not his last name, it's his hometown. Christ is not his last name, it's his title. Uh, all these things we learned in theology. So Ignatius is carried home to the town of Loyola to recuperate, and as he's recuperating, he begins to reflect. And as he lays on his recuperation bed, he has time to ponder his life. Perhaps for the first time in his life, he has time to wonder what he really is becoming and who he wants to be. And he begins to get in touch with the desires of his heart about what it is he really wants to do with his life and his time, whatever time he had left. And he feels coming out of him a desire to do something great for God. There's an arrogance in Ignatius early on where he says, I could be a better saint than Francis or Don. <laughs> That's pretty arrogant. <laughs> he read the stories of the lives of the saints and he read about Francis and Dominic and he said, these are extraordinary people who dedicated their lives to doing something because of their faith, because they've come to know Jesus. I can do better. And I think that's where the idea of Jesuit high school is first crept in. <laughs> we could do this better. Ignatius' transformation, though, unfolds over time. It doesn't happen in a moment. It's not a lightning bolt conversion. It's not being knocked to the ground like Paul of Tarsus. It's an evolution of his realization of what it was God was doing with him. And he came to believe some essential things about his life, as he looked back on it, that God had, in fact, been companioning him all along. That if he really pondered it, he could look at moments in his life and say, that was God's presence in my life. Not just high moments, but also difficult moments. That's God in there somewhere. And God seems to be teasing out of me, Ignatius says, a response. Never forcing me, but inviting me to some sort of response. What does Ignatius believe to be true about the world? That God exists. That God can be known. That God doesn't play games with us. That God is going to come to us through our lived experience to invite us to some sort of fuller life. That God is going to use us to do something if we will collaborate, to cooperate with God. And so Ignatius' way of looking at the world shifts. And he begins to see different patterns and possibilities in life that he hadn't seen before. And he begins to claim his faith and his friendship with God in a whole new way. I'd like to summarize the nation of spirituality, this Jesuit thing, with three words. Attention, gratitude, and service. Because I think this gets to what the nation of Loyola was talking about and what he had come to believe to be true. Again, I love this image of the lenses that we filter life through. The kinds of things that we filter in and filter out. And Ignatius comes to a point in his life where what he wants to see is God. Now we may laugh at that or we may say, that's fine for saints, but I'm really busy and I got a lot going on in my life. And to get up every morning and say, I'm going to look for God is a little frivolous. Or maybe it's too ethereal, too spiritual. It doesn't sound like something I could do. And it's precisely what Ignatius says we ought to be doing. And it's precisely what we want to be about in a Jesuit high school, or any kind of Jesuit mission. Attention, gratitude, and service. What do you notice in the course of the day? What sorts of things stand out to you? We've all had these experiences, I think, where some particular thing is on our mind heavily, and so we notice it or attendant issues in ways we never noticed them before. You see the doctor, and the doctor says, well, it could be this, so we'll run some tests. And so you run home and start looking it up. Bad idea. <laughs> Scary, right? And you begin to get data and talk to people and you say, hey, I think I'm pretty worried about this thing. The doctor says it might be this. And your friend says, well, my mother-in-law had that. And so you get some data, albeit skewed through your friend's lens. And you begin to gather this data. And all of a sudden, you become so obsessed about this issue, might be so. And you're beginning to gather data totally differently than you had the moment before you walked into the doctor's office. You're seeing everything differently. 
Whatever your profession is, whatever it is you do with your day, you've trained yourself to see the world differently. If you're an accountant, you look at numbers and spreadsheets and financial reports differently than most of the rest of us. If you're a doctor, you look at the human body differently. If whatever it is you do, you have trained yourself to see it differently. Well, heck, Ignatius says, what if you could train yourself? What if you could train yourself to see God better? If you could be more attentive to God's presence in your life. What does it look like to pay attention, to notice God? There was, I always tell the story of this woman that I knew in Berkeley when I was in graduate school. Uh, I've told her story a thousand times, and this is 15 years ago, and she, so her face is so seared in my memory, she had such an impact on me. She was this crazy lady who lived next door to us when I was in graduate school. And we thought she was totally off her rocker because she would come out of a house every day, this house that was covered with all sorts of foliage, and she would come out with two giant shopping bags filled with some unknown product. She had a gigantic hat, gigantic hat on her head, and she would make her way into Berkeley and just roam around Berkeley. She stood out even in Berkeley. <laughs> She would never tell us her name or anything about herself, and she would never speak to us in our first language, which for all of us in the house was English. She would find some sort of language you had a facility with other than English, and she would address you in that language. Okay. <laughs> so my brothers that I lived with, that is, my religious community brothers, had this unbelievably bad idea when we first moved into the house, which was to put me in charge of the landscaping in the garden of the house. I have a gift for killing living things. I know that's not what I should tell you when you can trust with your children. But nonetheless, people I'm okay with, plants and living things like that, I'm a little problematical around. But so I was in charge of these plants, and I would be out in front of the house with these extraordinary things called ice plants. I've never seen them before. I grew up in Chicago, these beautiful oranges and yellows and these colors of these plants. And I would be out there trying to pull out what I thought were weeds from the rest of these beautiful flowers. And I would be cursing under my breath that I was there wasting time kneeling on the concrete. Do you know how much that hurts? Kneeling on the concrete, pulling out these weeds and thinking to myself, I could be doing so many other great things. I should be in a cafe right now thinking theological thoughts, wearing gray and smoking folk cigarettes. <laughs> I mentioned it was Berkeley. And so <laughs> she would sidle up every time that this was happening. And I would be lost in my own little world of complaining. And she would sidle up with her shopping bags and her giant hat, Madame de Chateau, we called her, because she had no name, only a hat as a description. And I would look over my shoulder and say, Oh, bonjour, madame. And she would speak to me in French. And she would exhaust my French skills in about two and a half minutes. And then she would just stand there. And I would think to myself, you know, like, I got time for this. This is nuts. And then after a while, while looking at the plants, she would simply say in French, and the eyes to see. To have the eyes to see. She would walk off into her daily routine at Burke. And I would think, forget the crank. What a weird, you know, <laughs> she, and get a job. What is she doing? I don't know what her deal is. She's, you want to help me? You know, you can help pull out some of these leaves. That would be helpful. What's in those bags? <laughs> she was a mystic. She really wasn't a crank. She wasn't crazy. She got it. And that simple prayer of gratitude that escaped her lips when she would see something beautiful like that. That she would take the time to pause and notice it and recognize it and savor it a little bit and then just say, yeah, have the eyes to see that. To pay attention to what's there in front of you. I don't know if you've had the experience, but when something shifts dramatically in your life and all of a sudden it looks differently. The Germans have this great word, Schadenfreude, I don't know if you know this word, it's a great cocktail party word. Uh, it's, it's, it's to sort of take pleasure that somebody else's pain is theirs and not yours. It's not masochism, it's not to wish bad things on anybody, but it's just a sense of, whoo, it's not me. And I'll admit to you, uh, without any embarrassment, I get that feeling every time I leave awake. Um, whoo. It's 
not me in the box, or it's not my family. I go to a lot of ways, but there's this feeling, this weird, odd feeling. It happens to me in hospitals, too. When I visit someone in the hospital, and then you walk out, and I feel a little bit guilty. It's like, oh, I feel so bad for my friend there in the hospital, but whew, it's not me. And I feel this sort of burst of hope and light, like, okay, Pat, you're not sick, or you're dead, so go on and do something with this gift of life you have now. There's a wonderful Simpsons episode that deals with this, uh, as they dealt with most of the great philosophical conundrums. <laughs> There's an episode that you may have seen, uh, and if you haven't, I encourage you to download it, uh, where Homer believes that he's going to die because he's eating blowfish. Uh, and he makes a list of all the things he's going to do before he dies, and he thinks he has 48 hours to live. So he makes a list of all these things, and he's rushing to do this in 48 hours, and the last thing he does is he's going to listen to the entire Bible on tape. Uh, and so he buys the Bible on tape, and it's Larry King reading the Bible. And he puts the tape on, and he falls asleep with his lazy boy in the house, and he wakes up, and, then, and Marge wakes up the next morning, and she comes down to embrace what she believes is her dead husband sitting in his lazy boy, and she notices that his skin is warm. He's still alive. Homer lives. And now Homer has this enlightenment. He's had this brush with death. And after the brush with death, he now says, it's all going to be different. It's all going to change now. I now see it all so differently. I've got new priorities. It's all going to shift now. And the final scene is beautiful in its poetry. It is Homer sitting by himself in his underwear, eating pork rinds and watching bowling on television. <laughs> All of it is different. <laughs> we have these things that come into our lives that shift our perspective and our purpose, and we might even shift our priorities. But Ignatius is saying to us, what if you saw every day different? What if your ability to attend to what is going on around you would help you to recognize the presence of the God that's all around us? Gerard Manley Hopkins, the Jesuit poet, puts it this way in his poetry. The world is charged up with the grandeur of God. It's as if the world is pulsating with the presence of God, Hopkins says. And yet we miss it most of the time. It presumes Ignatius' perspective, this fundamentally Catholic way of looking at the world. It presumes that God is out there to be recognized, to be noticed. We in the Catholic Church use the term sacrament or sacramentality to speak of this. Not just the seven sacraments of the church, rituals, but this principle of sacramentality that says everything in the world has the potential of revealing God to me. Everything comes to me. In the words of St. Francis de Sales, not a Jesuit, but a good guy, St. Francis de Sales says, everything comes to me pregnant with the possibility of God. Will I live life? Everything comes to us pregnant with the possibility of God. Ignatius of Loyola, the mystic, say, hey, God is all around pulsating through this creation of God's. Did you notice it today? And if you did, what would it do for you? How would it change you? How would it shift your perspective? How would it reorient your priorities? What would it take? Attention, gratitude, and service. And so Ignatius says, what if we trained ourselves to be more attentive to God's presence in the world? You've trained yourself to see all sorts of things for your career, for your family life. I was driving home last night. Uh, I went up to see my dad. He lives way out in the south suburbs. And uh, it took me two and a half hours to get to his house. And uh, you have to know my father to truly appreciate the, the, just the frank candor he likes to offer me. And I was leaving Northwestern Hospital downtown, and I called him to see if he would give me permission to not come and see him for dinner. <laughs> but I couldn't say that outright, so I said, Dad, uh, I just got in the car, I'm on Superior, I, I've seen the light change four times already, I've moved three feet, he said, yeah, that's terrible. <laughs> and because he's my father, he said, how many times have I told you don't use Superior? <laughs> And I said it was an hour and ten minutes on 95th Street. 
and my father lives in Flossmoor. Uh, if you know anything about that geography, that's about 190th. So I got to I-57, and they said it's backed up to, up to level 111, and they added the report. They just do this. They know where I am in the car. And then the guy at WDBM, every 10 minutes on the 8th, is telling me it's going to be longer than we thought. And so I finally got up to my father's house. It was snowing like crazy, and these highways are a mess, and I got the blizzard of uh, snowmageddon, as they like to call it, in the back of my mind from last week. And I got to tell you, I drove very differently on the way home than I did on the way there, because it got really scary, and I was looking at things differently, and I was noticing things on the road I had never seen before. I cared enough, and I was worried enough to shift the way I was thinking. What would it be like to shift our way of thinking such that when we wake up in the morning, we'd see our lives as a God us? We'd see our guide in our lives as an opportunity to experience God in the midst of what's happening in the day. Attentiveness, attention. The example, the prayer that we teach the kids, the prayer that we share with you, the prayer that Ignatius said was the sine qua non of a religious and spiritual life. We never let go of the examine. The examine is this prayer of attentiveness. And one of the things we're trying to inculcate in kids who come to Loyola Academy is a different way of seeing the world that is with the bias that there is a good God in the world that is inviting them to respond with their lives, with their talents, with their time, with their vocation. I love the poetry of Mary Oliver, and I say it to the kids all the time. They're sick of it. But her poem then concludes with the question, what will you do with your one wild and precious life? That's Ignatius' question. If God is all around you, if God sent you into this world with a set of skills and talents and dreams and desires, if God is giving you this time on this earth and God is constantly teasing a response out of you, not a distant God who has sent you into the world and walked away, but the God that Jesus had come to know as my companion, my co-laborer at my elbow, what is it you will do in response to that presence and that invitation? And so we teach them the examine. And we teach them the examine because we want it to become a habit of their hearts. We want it to become a habit of reflection. Kierkegaard, the great uh, Dutch existentialist philosopher, said the problem with life is that you've got to live forward, but you only understand backwards. <laughs> Think about this. It's so true, right? Life is constantly pulling you into the next moment. The next time anybody tells me, I'm just too busy and I have too much going on, I'm going to punch. <laughs> because it's true for all of us. I get it. You're really busy. We're really, really busy. How you been, Pat? I'm really busy. Who cares? <laughs> I marvel, and honestly, God, every once in a while I get these extraordinary affirmations of my vow of celibacy when I leave my sister's house. <laughs> hey, you gotta take what you can get. <laughs> but when I think of, I'll be at a meeting or something, or I'll be at my sister's house, and I think, I'm going home. It's my quiet little room up on top of the wall. These kids are like running around doing stuff. They won't go to bed. It's not magic, it's not focus focus, it's not some crazy ritual or rite in the church that's going to be portrayed by Anthony Hopkins in a really bad movie. <laughs> but it's something about training the heart. You know, athletes talk about muscle memory all the time, that in their particular sport, they don't have to constantly remind themselves of the fundamentals of the game. They don't step into the batter's box and say, now how is it that you hold this thing? I mean, the Cubs do, but that... Uh, <laughs> I know how to do this 
because my body, my physical body, my muscles know what this is. And Ignatius is basically saying across the ages, there's a thing called soul memory. There's a way that you can train the soul and the eyes of the soul and the eyes of your body to see differently so that it's perceiving as habit or as memory the presence of God in the world. And so that examine, when it becomes a habit, starts to shrink that gap between the pull of the future and the reflection of the past to the contemplative posture in the moment. Contemplatives in action was a phrase Ignatius loved to describe this Jesuit thing. To perceive God in this moment, what would it be like to perceive God in this moment? <clears throat> Attention. When I come to recognize God's presence, don't I feel moved to gratitude? Don't I feel some sort of movement of thankfulness for what is? When I ponder the presence of God in my life and the faces of my children and my family and my friends or in the dreams of my heart or even in the worst moments of my life where some strange reality, even in the brokenness and the struggle, confirmed for me that this God is real and is close by and loves me. Don't you feel moved in those levels of attentiveness to gratitude? And then Ignatius asks the question, from that place of gratitude, what do you feel happening inside of you? Don't you feel moved to do something in response? Think of Bartimaeus. As Bartimaeus is moving on now after encountering Jesus and getting his vision, there has to be this sense of, of gratitude, this overwhelming sense of gratefulness that's emerging in him. And what will he do with that gratitude? Sit in the couch and eat pork rinds, or live a changed life. And Ignatius says, when you become in touch with that gratitude, you will be impelled to respond somehow. Don't you feel the desire to give it away in love and service? Don't you feel that you ought to respond to God's great goodness to you in the ways you engage the world tomorrow? in the way you choose to use your time and your talents. Don't you feel that gratitude that wells up inside of you because you come to know God's presence in the world invites you, doesn't demand, invites you to do something in response, service, attention, gratitude, and service. This Jesuit thing is about seeing the world differently being moved to an attitude of gratitude. Or, as one great Jesuit thinker says, Ignatius function with a hermeneutic of appreciation. Hermeneutic is a frame of understanding, a way to make sense of the world. And Ignatius's way of understanding the world, his worldview, his lens was appreciation. To move into the course of the day, appreciative of what it was God was doing with him and inviting him to do and to be. Attention. Gratitude and service. What we hope to do in Jesuit mission, what we hope to do in a Jesuit school, is to share that vision. It is a vision of the world that is shot through with hope. It is a vision of the world that is utterly convinced of the palpable presence of God in our stories not just through some formulas of theology or prayer, but in the stuff of your life and mine, the matter, the events of our lives. That is God inviting us, whispering to us. And we're going to train our students and ourselves to listen for that voice, to hear that invitation from God to test their limits on playing fields and theater stages and classrooms and with their friends. We want to give them a constructive and fun and safe context to test those limits and to come to recognize that those things are not just accidental or happenstance, but what they are experiencing is in fact the presence of God. And a God who wants to get very close to them. A God who wants to abide in that great language of the scriptures. A God who will stay at the elbow and never leave and to tease out of them a life of meaning, a life of purpose, a life of gratitude and service. 
And when they do that, when we do that in our own living, flawed ways, Ignatius assures us, you will come to understand the central Christian truth. That what God sent you into the world to do, tonight and tomorrow, is to give yourself away in love and service. That what God sent you into the world to do in your unique way that no other creature in the history of the universe can do in the circumstances that you know and call your life, is to give yourself away. And in doing so, to become yourself, to receive yourself. If you love your life, you'll lose it, Jesus says. But if you give it away, you'll get it and so much more. That's the Ignatian view, that's the Jesuit way, that's the Catholic way. It's our privilege to hold that in trust, that vision of Ignatius, and share it with the world in the ways we live and teach and laugh and love and build up community. And I think it's what the Jesuit thing is that we've all been invited to do. It's a great privilege to do that with you and to build that in our little corner of the kingdom of God. Thanks for partnering with us.